Good morning, and welcome to worship with the community of First United Methodist Church, where we believe that everyone is a beloved child of God on a journey to God with God. I'm Brad King, one of the associate pastors here. My pronouns are he and him, and I'm so happy you decided to join us for worship this morning. As usual, we'll start with a few brief announcements, but as I'm letting you know what's going on in and around this community, remember, even if we're not seated next to one another, we are gathered as a community by the Holy Spirit. So greet your family in Christ in the chat or comments below. First things first, I wanna let you know about something that's happening next Sunday, April 18th from 12 to 1 p.m. University United Methodist Church just up the road from us is gonna hold a lunch and learn on propositions B and F, uh, which will be a part of our next election. And, and early voting uh, is starting Monday, April 19th, the day after this lunch and learn. So it's very timely. Prop B would criminalize some aspects of, of homelessness and Proposition F would restructure our government. Both of these propositions could have some real impacts on our community and maybe even some of the ministries that you're involved in. So this is a great time to learn about what's going on and get civically engaged. Also happening next Sunday, right after this Lunch and Learn. So you can go to church, go to a Lunch and Learn, and then come back to church for a Bible study. We'll be continuing our pilot program for a once a month after church Bible study that we're calling Deep Dive into Scripture. We'll talk about some of the scripture from the services of the previous month, and I'll do my best to answer any questions you might have, or at least figure out where that answer might be. That information is in your e-news along with a registration link. And of course, if you have any questions, you can email me. Also, starting this week, one on Tuesday and one on Wednesday, we have two book studies running through the month of April. On Tuesdays from 6 to 8.30 p.m., Pastor Kathy will be leading us through historian Martha Jones's book, Vanguard, How Black Women Broke Barriers, Won the Vote, and Insisted on Equality for All. It's an incredible book that re-examines and offers a new history of African-American women's political lives in America. That Zoom invitation will be sent with registration, and again, the registration link is in your e-news. Starting on Wednesday from 6 to 7 p.m., so yes, if you love book studies, you can do both. Janet Duke will be leading a study of Marcus Borg's Convictions, How I Learned What Matters Most. This is Borg's final book uh, at the end of a long and illustrious career. And in it, he asks, what does it mean to be a Christian in America today? Borg takes up lots of questions that we love to have here around this church. I think it'll be a great time. And Janet is a great teacher. Now, as we prepare to join together to worship God, please join me in the response. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Please join me in the call to worship. We gather as people on a journey. We believe and we have doubts. We do good and we sin. We are imperfect humans, still beloved by God. Love and grace, hope and faith, these are the essence of the one we call God. We seek forgiveness and grace from God and from those we've harmed. 
Assured of that grace, we are ready to grow again. We yearn for a new way, a new perspective, and a clear path. Though we are full of trust and full of doubt, we are here. Speak to us, God. Continue creating us. Inspire our hearts, enlighten our minds, guide our actions. Amen. Join your hearts with mine in prayer. Wonderful mystery, you invite our entire selves into your care, celebrating our greatest strengths and lamenting our weaknesses. With your hands covering our scars, you declare us your delight, repairing what was broken, not with anger or disgust, but with love. May we learn to trust in this love faithful and everlasting. Amen. with mine in the prayer for illumination. Calm us now, O Lord, into a quietness that heals and listens. Open wounded hearts to the balm of your word. Speak to us in clear tones so that we might feel our spirits leap for joy and skip with hope as your resurrection witnesses. 
Amen. Today's first reading comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning and welcome. I'm Taylor First. I'm the senior pastor at First United Methodist Church of Austin. My pronouns are she and her, and I am so glad you're joining us for worship today. When I hear this passage from the Gospel of John, it makes me think about all of the things that we hear and see differently these days. Things that we um, think about differently because we have lived through and are living through a pandemic. I was talking this week with my hairstylist about this, and for her, the strange thought was remembering how she used to go out to eat with friends, and she wanted to try a bite of what everybody else was eating around the table. That used to be so normal, but now it just seems kind of strange to imagine sitting across the table from a friend and saying, ooh, can I try that? That seems bizarre now. A funny one I heard on the radio was uh, about bowling. Through this fit of giggles, a man was describing the complete absurdity when you look at, at bowling through a pandemic lens. He said, um, we would share bowling balls, and so you would stick your fingers into the holes on the ball, and then you would go take a bite of nachos while someone else stuck their fingers into the same holes of the same ball. Not to say that there are not more sanitary ways to bowl, but it just underscores how different our lenses are these days, how differently we see and hear things now. So when Jesus waltzes into the room with the disciples and breathes on everybody, it just lands a little differently than it used to, doesn't it? Let's back up and, and remember where we are in the story. The scene happens on Easter Sunday, at least the first scene in this passage. Jesus has already been raised from the dead. Easter has happened. The good news has been proclaimed in this gospel by Mary, uh, Mary Magdalene, who encountered the risen Christ in the garden and immediately went and told the disciples all about it. So they have heard the news, and yet here they are, later that evening, huddled inside with the doors locked. It seems like the, the good news did not really send them out into the streets to proclaim Christ the Lord is risen today to everybody who would listen. They didn't do that. 
instead of being exuberant, they were terrified. It's like Jesus' plan has kind of backfired. Either they don't believe that he really is risen, or maybe they just don't know what to make of it. Their doors are locked, locked for protection, locked to keep anybody else out. But those doors, the locked doors are also keeping all of them in. And since they are the only ones who have heard the good news that Jesus is risen and has returned, those locked doors are also holding back the good news from the rest of the world. The effect here is, it's kind of like that old question about if a tree falls in the forest and no one is there to hear it, does it make a sound? If God breaks the chains of death and sin and no one hears about it, does it make a difference? If the disciples stay behind their locked doors and never come out to share and to exercise the truth and power of resurrection, then does it even matter? Part of the good news of this story is that Jesus doesn't just sit outside and wait around for the disciples to get it. Jesus doesn't need them to unlock the door in order to let him in. He goes where he pleases, whether the door is locked or not. And I tell you what, that has been good news for the church all throughout our history. Whenever the church has locked its doors to reform, Jesus has found a way in anyway. When the church in America, the white church in America, locked its doors to emancipated slaves, Jesus walked right through that wall and made a way. When the church locked its doors to female clergy, Jesus didn't even have to pick the lock. And even now, as the church shuts out LGBTQ uh, members and communities, Jesus continues to just bust right through that wall, to come in anyway. The fact that Jesus pays no mind to the walls that we put up and the doors that we lock has always been and will always be good news for the church. He will not be bound by the limitations that we set. But in passing through that wall, through that locked door, Jesus doesn't just discard those sad, scared, hunkered down disciples. He doesn't say, oh, I've tried one too many times with y'all, I'm done. He doesn't decide that they're useless and then bypass them to accomplish his purpose. He goes in there to them. He enters into their fearful place, to their locked up place, and he breathes on them. Now we're back to the breathing. <laughs> so what does this breath do? What does it mean? What is Jesus giving them? Well, let's remember that in Hebrew, the word for breath is the same as the word for wind, and it's the same as the word for spirit. In Genesis, when God creates the human being, after God has shaped it and formed it out of the dirt, it's not alive yet, not until God breathes into it. God gives it breath and spirit and life. Then in the book of Ezekiel, the prophet stands in the valley of dry bones, a place where death has just had its way. And the prophet calls the bones to come back to life. And at first the bones begin to rattle and they, they attach to one another. They begin to rebuild a body again. And there's sinews and there's flesh and skin covering them. But it says there was no breath in them. No breath or wind or spirit. Not until God tells the prophet to call forth the breath. To call forth the, the spirit to come from the four winds and to breathe life into the bones. And then they lived. 
Peter Marty reminded me this week that, that we need oxygen to live. But it's actually two kinds of oxygen that we need. One for breathing and one for hoping. And Jesus is in the business of giving out the hoping kind of oxygen. The kind that reinflates the soul and allows us to function with hope again. See, what Jesus does when he breathes on those disciples is to give them what they need. The hope, the peace, the power to unlock those doors and go out into the world to see just what the resurrection really means and to find out what it can do or what God can do through it and through us. That's the good news. When we face uncertainty, when we're not sure what to make of everything that is happening around us and we are afraid to take the next step, Jesus doesn't just leave us on our own, locked in a room with the good news. He comes to us again and again, right through our locked doors, and he empowers us with what we need his very own life and breath and spirit to unlock our doors and to take the risk of going out. It's a strange thing to say, take the risk of going out at a time like this when it is still safer to stay at home in the middle of a pandemic. But I think that perhaps we are deeply connected to the disciples in this story Things are changing around us once again. And we are all uncertain about what to do, about how to move forward as a church, in your businesses, in our families. Sometimes navigating our lives right now feels like two steps forward, one step back, and then a stumble to the side and then get back on track. It's still easy to get deflated to have the wind knocked out of us. But the risen Christ comes to us again with a fresh breath, new oxygen for the soul to empower us to unlock the door once again and to be a part of the new life that God is bringing. So let's put our hand on the lock and take a deep breath and go forward in hope. Amen. In the next few moments, we'll begin to offer up our prayers to God. If you'd like us to join you in prayer, please let us know who or what you're praying for in the chat or comments below. Let's go to prayer.
As we pray, please join in the response. I'll say, your song is wonderful to hear. And together we'll say, teach us the words, O Christ. Living and eternal Christ, in the midst of impermanence and earthly frailties, we have heard your resurrection song. We do not understand the words. We cannot find the notes. And yet we rejoice and join the chorus knowing that we sing at your invitation, even if we cannot hold the tune. Your song is wonderful to hear. Teach us the words, O Christ. The chorus grows, beloved, but many voices are absent, not for lack of love for you, but for the songs and the singers that drown you out with dissonant sounds and unjust words of sour melodies. Open our hearts to your song and let our voices ring out with the healing and the welcome that you offer. Teach us to magnify all that you are and all that you have done, playing your song with new notes that sound less like us and more like you. Your song is wonderful to hear. Teach us the words, O Christ. At times, beloved, our prayers find the empty air between the notes of your song. And we feel that we are singing alone or to no one. Sometimes the song seems to cut out just as we find the rhythm. But always it returns. A gentle hum at the edge of our hearing, a thrumming beat carried through the floor, a word of thanks or of kindness extended out of love. The notes are loud and broad and unmistakably yours. They bounce off of kind eyes and echo in sunsets. They resound with parents' love and ring out with the laughter of children. Open our ears to the sound of your song. Open our hearts to the love of your kingdom. Your song is wonderful to hear. Teach us the words, O Christ. Fill us with all that is good so that we overflow, singing as we walk and inviting resurrection into this world with every step, just as you did when you walked in human form and taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we have this God who continues to break into our locked doors and invite us out to find out what our next step in faith would be to invite us to take that step with courage and hope. I hope you're hearing that invitation this week. And, uh, and if part of that invitation means um, finding out more about a community of faith, we would love to share with you more about our ministry and our mission here at First Church. We are um, building a community where all people are invited to know the love of God and are sent to join God in the transformation of the world. We would love to share more about that with you in our next First Steps class, which is coming up on May 16th. 
If you're interested in that, um, I would invite you to fill out our online connections card where you can check the box that says first steps there. And we will get in touch with you about that class, all the details. You'll have a chance to meet our pastors and staff and um, ask any questions that you have as well. We would love to have you there. Friends, part of the way that we live into that mission is through our gifts, through the, the gifts that we make that are a participation in God's work in the world through this church. So we are grateful for all of the ways that you give. And during this um, Easter season, we invite you to be a part of an extra um, special offering for our Easter offering. This year, that offering will be dedicated to the renovation of a restroom on the first floor of our sanctuary building. Uh, it's located right at the base of the main stairwell near Wesley Hall. And you may wonder um, why a renovation of a restroom is so important to us. We are a church that seeks to welcome all people. And we have been learning about what it means to create a space that is welcoming um, and an atmosphere that is welcoming to people of all gender identities, including those who identify as trans or non-binary. And so our goal is to convert the restroom at the bottom of the stairs that is currently a women's restroom that has two tiny little stalls into a single stall unisex restroom that would provide a centrally located restroom on the first floor that is welcome to all. Um, that remodel is going to make the bathroom more comfortable. It'll have room for a changing table and um, some updated safety modifications as well. So it's an important project. We have quite a long way to go. So I really ask you to consider participating in that Easter offering this year. We're hoping to raise $50,000 for that and we need your help to do it. So we ask you to consider going above and beyond your regular giving to participate in that. Now, as we prepare to make our gifts and to offer ourselves to God for God's use, I invite you to join your hearts with mine in our prayer of dedication. Holy God, we continue to hold on to the celebration and triumph of Easter. As we look back over the past year, we realize that many of us can identify with Thomas's doubt, wondering, can we be the church, the body of Christ, when when we can't see the body gathered in our sanctuary. And yet Christ has opened our eyes to his risen body that cannot be confined by walls and is not diminished by precautions and social distance. So as we make our gifts to you, we affirm the resurrection power that we have seen. And so we say again, Alleluia. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Oh, that is shown in 
Now let's continue in our celebration of the resurrection by singing together, Christ has risen. Join me as we bless one another for the week ahead. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Amen.